शलाकय चक्षुन्मील तस्म श्रीगुरव नम श्रीचैतन्य मनोदिष्ट स्थापित ये नूतले स्वयं रूप कदाम ददाती स्वदाक वंदेह श्रीगुर श्रीयुत पदकमल श्रीगुर वैष्णवांश श्रीरूप सागर जा सह गण रघुनाथाबित तम सजीव साइत सवदूत परिजन सहित कृष्ण चैतन्य देव श्रीराधा कृष्ण पाद सह गण ललिता श्री विशाखा विता नम ओं विष्णुपदाय कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वते देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चातिणे हे कृष्ण करुणा सिंधु दीनबंधु जगत्पते गोपेश गोपिका कांत राधा कांत नमस्तुते तप्त कांचन गौरांगी राधे वृंदावनेश्वरी ऋषभानुसुते देवी प्रणमा हरि प्रिय वाचाकूभ्य कृपा सिंधु पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गधाधर श्रीवासादी गौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण सो वेलकम टू द फ्राइडे एंड सैटरडे भक्ति शास्त्री सीरीज वी हैव बीन डिस्कसिंग टेक्स्ट फाइव and last class we were supposed to finish text 5 but there were many questions so that's why it stretched on for more so today we will be finishing text 5 and beginning with text 6 <clears throat> just to recap of uh, what we have discussed till now in text 5 text 5 speaks about uh, <clears throat> how <clears throat> madhyam adhikari should respect the kanishta madhyama and the uttama and <clears throat> madhyam adhikari trivid vaishnav seva this is what is text 5 speaking about and then we saw the various themes in the purports and went into the terminology of understanding what is the kanishta madhyama and uttama first from the nine stages how we can define this is kanishta madhyam uttama then from bhakti rasamrit sindhu perspective upadesh amrit perspective bhagavat perspective chaitanya charitamrit sanasana shiksha perspective and the kulina gram vasis and we summarized everything here in this chart how the various books classification is there and what the levels of the kanishta uttama and uh, madhyam uh, we can fix that and then what is the classification basis and what is the application so this different types of classifications we saw then we went into the purport how how madhyam adhikari deals with the three types of kanishtas in paragraph 4 then how he deals offers respects to bona fide vaishnavas paragraph 
and then paragraph 6 <clears throat> the definition of diksha and how 8 and 9 speak about how prabhupad uh, mentions how one comes in contact with his con becomes qualified to take diksha and how he takes diksha what are the you know qualities of one who wants to take diksha and how he gets initiated and from kanishta he progresses to madhyama so this is uh, where we were discussing and <clears throat> if you remember we discussed uh, uh, <clears throat> the chanting of the hari krishna maha mantra based on kanishta uttama and madhyama that is nama prada nama bhasya and shuddha naam that is shuddha naam <clears throat> so these are also based on the name you can classify them as kanishta madhyama uttama then prabhupad goes into the sanatan shiksha which we have already discussed the verses so i discussed briefly and here is where uh, we had finished our discussion now this is paragraph see the book Where is it? Shraddhavan hai jana. Hurry. Prabhu kahe andra muke. Page paragraph. Yeah, while Sanatan Goswami, this is over, I think. This is over now. We have discussed this in the last class. Yeah, now we have to come to, okay. 13th, we have finished. Oh, we have finished up till paragraphs 13. We have finished till 12 and 13, we have come now, I think. I don't remember discussing uh, paragraph 13. Shraddhan, sorry. Yes, yes. 13, we have finished. Correct. So we have finished this 13th paragraph. Uh, Satyaraj Khan, we have discussed this. And then we have discussed this paragraph 13. Shaddha Shabde. <clears throat> so, Sanatan Siksha, uh, uh, only Madhya Madhikari definition is given by Prabhupada here, but we have discussed Karnisht Adhikari, Madhyama, and Uttam, Proud Shaddha, one who has Proud Shaddha, and he has Shastrupta Nipuna. So, all these three definitions we have discussed in the slide. And based on Shaddha, one is designated as a Uttama, Kanishta, or Madhyama, Shraddha Nusari, based on faith. So this is the classification is based on faith. So everyone begins from the Kanishta platform, but somebody can go very fast to the Madhyama and then go to the Uttama. Somebody joins the Kanishta and very quickly he goes to the Madhyama and Uttama. Somebody takes many years. So that's how his advancement is. Uh, determined and this definition of faith Prabhupada gives in the next paragraph Shraddha Shabde Vishwas Kohe Sudrida Nishai Krishna Bhakti Kaile Sarva Karma Krita Hoy. By rendering transcendental service to Krishna, one automatically performs all subsidiary activities. By worshipping Krishna, you're worshipping the root of the tree. You need not worship any other demigods. This kind of faith we should have, Shraddha Shabda, Vishwas. Sudrida Nishai. Sudrida Nishai means one should have that confident, firm faith. What is that? If I do Krishna Bhakti Kaile, if I am doing Krishna Bhakti, then I need not perform 
any other duties towards the rishis demigods this worship that worship no i am worshiping the lord who is the root of the tree and by worshiping the supreme lord one automatically renders worship to all the devtas all human beings so this kind of faith is a very deep faith and that is why prabhupad gives the definition of faith now based on faith prabhupad explains how <clears throat> he connects faith with bhagavad gita faith means strong faith the words of bhagavad gita are authoritative instructions for faithful men and whatever krishna says in the bhagavad gita is to be accepted as it is without interpretation this is the way arjuna accepted bhagavad gita after hearing bhagavad gita arjuna told krishna sarvam etadritam manne yanmam vadasi keshava oh krishna i totally accept as truth all that you have told me so here propos is connecting that the more we study bhagavad gita and accept whatever the lord says in the bhagavad gita that is a sign of faith of course <clears throat> this faith is not just blind faith we reason we have doubts and <clears throat> we ask the spiritual master our doubts then the spiritual master explains and then we understand the subject data it's not just blind faith so for us <clears throat> we have to go through this purification of the heart of trying to understand the bhagavad gita by clearing all the doubts arjuna <clears throat> is also asking questions to krishna and krishna is answering in the third chapter in the fourth chapter in the fifth chapter repeatedly arjuna is putting forth questions and only in the 10th chapter <clears throat> after he shares the chatur shloki bhagavad gita then arjuna speaks these two verses so it is after you put questions you clear your doubts you understand the science of godhead spoken by the lord himself spoken in the guru shish parampara then your faith keeps on growing the faith develops that is shraddha shabda vishwas sudrida vishay so uh doubts have to be resolved and uh doubt is as also a sign of faith doubt is also a sign of intelligence and when we express these doubts and clarify these doubts the intelligence gets purified and that's how the subtle body gets purified and then uh, transcendental knowledge is awakened in us and the faith of the soul is strengthened we develop deep faith in krishna deep faith in the words of krishna deep faith in the shastras and with that faith we practice spiritual life so that is how the development of faith comes this is the correct way paragraph 13 to understand bhagavad correct way of understanding bhagavad gita and this is called shraddha if it is not that one accepts a portion of bhagavad gita according to his own whimsical interpretations and then rejects another portion this is not shraddha so one great scholar you no know, he has commented on sarva dharman paritajya sarva dharman paritajya maam ekam sharanam vraja so he with this interpretation if krishna is telling to give up dharma you know then what is this so he could not understand that there is higher dharmas also so he says you know <clears throat> he has given some his own whimsical interpretation about that verse so sarva dharman paritajya means give up all the lower dharmas and perform the supreme dharma that is what bhakti yoga surrender unto love to me mam ekam sharanam raja so rejecting one <clears throat> no sarva dharman paritajya is wrong you no know, he has commented like that what the lord lord has spoken is wrong so this kind of interpretation will not help this is not shraddha proper says shraddha means accepting the instructions of bhagavad gita in their totality especially the last instruction sarva dharman paritajya mam ekam sharanam raja abandon all varieties of religion and just surrender to me so the highest religion is the highest dharma of the soul is to serve the lord in pure love and faith that is bhakti yoga when one becomes completely faithful in regard to this instruction one strong faith becomes the basis of advancing in spiritual life so only when that 
you know, we begin with this faith and when this faith is strengthened, then we can advance. It is based on faith only Kanishta, Madhyam and Uttam have been uh, mentioned. Proud Shraddha, matured faith, deep faith in Krishna, deep faith in Krishna's instructions, deep faith in the protection of Krishna. So this is how uh, Prabhupada is uh, connecting with that uh, verse from the Chaitanya Charitamrita of definition of Shraddha and how uh, Shraddha is development of faith of understanding the Bhagavad Gita. Now, paragraph 14, Prabhupada explains, this is the theme in paragraph 14 now. In paragraph 14 and 15, I guess, yes, advancement from Kanishta to Uttam by chanting. So this is the theme which Prabhupada is going to speak in paragraph 14 and 15. So let us take up this. When one fully engages in chanting the Hare Krishna mantra, he gradually realizes his spiritual identity. Gradually. <clears throat> it is a very gradual process. It's not an overnight process. In fact, after many years of chanting, uh, this uh, state where we can realize our spiritual identity happens. Uh, the real revelation happens at the stage of bhava. But uh, our identity as different from the body uh, is at the stage of nishta. But when we start chanting Hare Krishna, we theoretically understand we are not the body, we are the spirit soul. And because we take up to spiritual life, we become free from bad habits, our faith uh, uh, slowly grows. We have jnana, knowledge that we are not the body, but we don't have that realization. So the realization gradually happens. Unless one faithfully chants the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, Krishna does not reveal himself. This is a very important uh, point to be noted. One has to faithfully chant. That means one should chant very attentively. Sevan Mukehi Jivvado Swayam Evas Puratada. Prabhupada quotes Bhakti Rasamrasalu. Atha Shri Krishna Madhi Na Bhavet Grahim Indriya Sevan Mukehi Jivvado Swayam Evas Puratada. We cannot realize the Supreme Personality of the Godhead by artificial means. We must engage faithfully in the service of the Lord. Such service begins with the tongue, which means we should always chant the holy names of the Lord and accept Krishna Prasad. So the tongue has these two functions, to accept Prasad, that is the Jnana Indriya, and to vibrate, it is a Karma Indriya also. So both these have to be engaged in Krishna's service. So Jiva Vegam was spoken in the first verse only we knew. So ultimately by the Jiva Vegam, Slowly, slowly, the you know the tongue gets spiritualized, and Krishna will reveal Himself. Swayam eva spuritada. We should not chant or accept anything else. When this process is faithfully followed, the Supreme Lord reveals Himself to the devotee. When a person realizes himself to be an eternal servitor of Krishna, he loses interest in everything but Krishna's service. So, what happens when you realize yourself as Krishna's servant? <clears throat> you become detached from matter and completely become attached to Krishna's service. So, this is the sign. Maya Sakta Manapartha Yogam Injan Madasha. You become completely asakt to Krishna and nirasakt to this material world. Completely detached from matter. Vasudeva Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Prayojita Janeti Ashu Vairagyam Jnanam Tad Ahetukam. So when the Bhagavati unto Vasudev fully matures Janeti Ashu Vairagyam detachment naturally and then <coughs> transcendental knowledge. With transcendental knowledge, detachment comes from this material world and you have attained perfection in one sense. <coughs> Always thinking of Krishna devising means by which to spread the holy name of Krishna. He understands his only business is spreading, is in spreading the Krishna conscious movement all over the world. Such a person is to be recognized as the Uttam Adhikari and his association should be immediately accepted according to the six 
processes dadati pratigranati so here we'll go back to this verse now nindadi shunya hridaye ipsita sangalabha so the madhyam adhikari should seek that association of that uttam adhikari now this definition or proper this speaking here these are the symptoms of a uttam adhikari what is that he has realized himself as the eternal servant of krishna he has lost complete interest in matter he is always thinking about devising means to spread krishna consciousness his only business is uh, spreading the krishna conscious movement all over the world he is to be considered as a uttam adhikari now <clears throat> when do we realize ourselves as the eternal servant servitor of krishna at what stage in the nine stages of bhakti anyone would like to answer can raise your hands among the nine stages of bhakti at which stage we realize ourselves at the eternal servitor of krishna there is one raised hand here with us they are participating here live with us but i would like to hear from the audience when do we realize this at what stage among the nine stages shraddha sadhu sangha bhajan kriya anartya vritti nishta ruchi asakti bhava and prema at what stage do we realize ourselves as the eternal servitor of krishna yeah one answer has been typed but it's typed to everyone so <laughs> everyone will know now the answer it is bhava at the stage of bhava yes at the stage of bhava we realize this and propas is describing uh, the uttam adhikari who is always devising means to spread the krishna consciousness so only uttam adhikari who is at the stage of bhava mahabhagavat he is engaged in the preaching work and such a uttam adhikari's association should be <coughs> taken up indeed an advanced uttam adhikari vaishnava devotee should be accepted as a spiritual master so we know that now so the uttam adhikari is uh, here even in the general chart you can see uh, it's bhava and prema stage so he is in the bhava and prema stage the uttam adhikari so only he has to be accepted as a spiritual master one who has reached the stage of bhava or the stage of prema in fact one who has reached the stage uh, reached the stage of bhava very soon bhava will fortify into prema very quickly it will fortify into prema there is no doubt about it <clears throat> everything one possesses should be offered to him for it is enjoined that one should deliver whatever he has to the spiritual master the brahmachari in particular is supposed to beg arms from others and offer them to the spiritual master so this was how traditionally in the gurukul the the disciples used to be under the shelter of the spiritual master go and beg arms and then come and offer to the spiritual master and then <clears throat> later on if the spiritual master calls them for lunch then only they would come otherwise they had to fast so the same principle prabhupada introduced it in iskon where we go out for book distribution and we give charity in the form of krishna's holy name krishna's books by which we can connect people to krishna and they give donations which we come and give back to the temple so that is how proper that introduce however one should not imitate the behavior of a advanced devotee or mahabhagavat without being self realized for by such imitation one will eventually become degraded so a spiritual master who is at a very advanced stage uh, he's got the spiritual potency externally his activities you might imitate but internally you cannot do this imitation it will not stay for long and that is why if you try to imitate it will degrade you bhakti you know thakur mentions that there are these nine stages and he says that slowly with the purification of the subtle body especially the mind and intelligence one goes to higher stages and if 
he tries to go artificially to higher stages uh, he will fall down back to the lower stages in fact because his intelligence is not purified and buddhi nashat pranashati as it is mentioned in the bhagavad gita also his intelligence gets degraded and he uh, falls down so that's why this artificial imitation should not be you no know, done without having that level propad now concludes the last theme in this verse shila rupa swami advises the devotee to be intelligent enough to distinguish between kanishta madhyama and uttam adhikari so this intelligence comes with the understanding of shastra and the internal vision which develops that not all devotees are on the same platform and we should distinguish them then what's propad say the devotee should not should also know his own position and should not try to imitate a devotee situated on a higher platform he should also know where he is situated which position whether is a kanishta madhyama or a uttama and he should not try to imitate shila bhakti vinod thakur has given some practical hints to the effect of that of a uttam adhikari vaishnava can be recognized by his ability to convert many fallen souls to vaishnavism so bhakti no thakur uh, especially in his hari naam chintamani mentions that uh, mahabhagavat vaishnav pradhan he is called that's what the term bhakti no thakur uses he says that <clears throat> he is able to give should the naam to others by which he is so pure like he is like a chintamani and anyone who comes in touch with him he attains pious credits bhakti impressions are imprinted on his heart and he takes up to chanting the holy name just like chintamani when it touches iron it turns into gold similarly coming in touch with such a mahabhagavat people become transformed and they become vaishnavas they start chanting hari krishna so that is the potency of a mahabhagavat he says in that article that a kanishth adhikari maybe once when he was in the dham or when during the festival he might chant, chant once shuddha naam a madhyam adhikari uh, avoids offenses and is able to take shuddha naam continuously a uttam adhikari not only chants shuddha naam but he is able to give naam and transform others and make others take the name of krishna so that is the level of the uttam adhikari so this is how we can understand who is a uttam adhikari see how many people he has brought to vaishnavism that is how you can identify who is a uttam adhikari this is some practical hint now very important instruction for sadhakas one should not become a spiritual master unless he has attained the platform of uttam adhikari so propad is very clearly mentioning that only one who is at this stage uttam adhikari bhava and prema and this will coincide with the uh, with the <clears throat> bhagavad definition the bhagavad definition the noi definition and the cc definition sorry the kulina grama definition these three it will coincide but not the bhakti rasamrit sindhu and the sanatan shiksha because these are parallels as i had mentioned so uttam adhikari here means who is on the bhava and the prema platform one should not become a spiritual master a neophyte vaishnava or a vaishnava situated on a intermediate platform can also accept disciples but such disciples must be on the same platform and it should be understood that they cannot advance very well towards the ultimate goal under his insufficient guidance now this is a very important point propad is explaining here now let us go to this chart and try to understand now even a madhyam adhikari can accept disciples madhyam adhikari means somebody who has crossed nishta he might be at the stage of ruchi or asakti also so he is highly qualified in fact in one sense so he can also accept disciples from the lower ranks somebody who is in bhajan kriya anarth nivritti but propa is saying that 
ऑल्दोह मध्य मधिकारी कैन एक्सेप्ट डिसाइपल्स बट द न्यू फाइट्स हू एक्सेप्ट मध्य मधिकारी एज अ स्पिरिचुअल मास्टर दे कैनॉट एडवांस टू द हाइएस्ट गोल ऑफ कृष्ण प्रेम फर्स्ट थिंग सेकेंडली द न्यू फाइट्स कैन द मध्य मधिकारी सपोज ही इज एट द स्टेज ऑफ रुचि he can take that disciple only up till the stage of ruchi because he is also at that stage he cannot take them to higher stages this is the second point to be noted and ultimately he cannot take them to the ultimate goal of life that is krishna prem so this is a very very important point so another thing is that they should be on little equal platform that not that you know uh they are too much in the beginning platform they should be also somewhere here and they can uh, take them to a little higher levels but they cannot take to the highest level of krishna prem and that's why propad conclu- concludes therefore is concluding a disciple should be careful to accept an uttam adhikari as a spiritual master he should be very carefully understand how, how all the spiritual masters how what their level is by understanding what propad has given in this discussion and carefully select a spiritual master who is a uttam adhikari so this is how propad concludes this discussion any questions or clarifications you have up till now what we discussed we have finished text 5 we will begin text 6 uh, now होली नेम ऑफ द लॉर्ड so they are saying preachers so does that also come under the category of uh, people who um spread or do they come under uttam adhikari okay this Because is a statement according... yeah this is the statement na you are speaking about yes prabhu because now we saw that practical hints say that we can recognize by their ability to convert so preachers are the ones who most uh, generally are the people who influence so uh, i find a contradiction prabhu can you please help me understand that okay all contradictions are resolved in the scriptures <laughs> <laughs> now here it is very important to understand this statement let us understand first this statement and then we will take up your question proper is saying on the other hand we have witnessed that some of our contemporaries who are supposed to be great preachers now supposed to be he has used proper use the word contemporaries proper is speaking about his god brothers god brothers means many of his god brothers who were sanyasis also now they have gradually fallen in the material concept because they have failed to chant the holy name of the lord now here proper is speaking about Mm, those who uh, criticize and uh, find faults because you know there were many issues uh, when propad the western world preacher came back to india many godders had many issues the way propad was you know conducting his preaching and there were little you know family cons- uh, conflicts within uh, with his god brothers so <clears throat> they uh, they had this difference of opinion about how bhakti siddhan sir takur wanted the movement to spread so from that perspective prabhupada is speaking so if you are chanting but you are criticizing then your chanting will not give, give effect it will not have effect so that is why prabhupada is mentioning that they have gradually fallen into the material conception of life and if we criticize ultimately slowly what happens is ultimately we will lose taste in chanting so that is what propad is hinting now now the second aspect which uh, with respect to your question is now preachers 
uh, are of different different levels and i will just give you some hints about different levels of preachers by which we can understand who is real preacher <clears throat> preacher means somebody who also studies the bhakti shastras practices spiritual life he is able to uh, get connect people to krishna consciousness he is able to install shraddha in them instill shraddha faith in them by which they take up to chanting but these kind of preachers cannot take those <clears throat> candidates to higher levels of anarth nivritti and nishta there are other preachers who are more advanced who can give deep sambandh gyan knowledge about krishna and uh, resolve the philosophical questions which the sadhakas have and only when these uh, questions are resolved uh, they also get purified and then they can make further advancement so there are advanced preachers also who have a deep knowledge of the shastras there are other preachers who are mahabhagavats who just by one word speaking we can transform the person <laughs> so there is achar as well as prachar there are some preachers who need not speak just by seeing them one becomes transformed into a devotee <laughs> so many people saw prabhupad prabhupad the way he just walked that royal you know elegance with which he moved you no know, prabhupad's actions just seeing them they were mesmerized and they became devotees so preachers are like that in different different levels so we should understand the highest preacher is is a mahabhagavat who is living the teachings and just by coming in touch he is like a uh just like a a nuclear blast the radiation spreads and it stays for many years you know that so similarly he is carrying the spiritual potency of the lord in the heart and just by coming in touch near him you can feel the spiritual potency in your heart and that instills you faith and you take the holy name so that is a mahabhagavat who is a very pure devotee the others they have to you know conduct many courses and uh, put a lot of efforts to Uh, transform them and take up to devotional service and there are other preachers who also uh, can instill little faith uh, in the beginners to take up to spiritual life so like that there are <clears throat> a different level of preachers that also we should have understanding i hope uh, that clarifies the point mata ji Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Prabhu. Thank you, Prabhu. Any other questions? Anyone has? You have any questions? Okay. So then now we will go today. We have another fifty minutes. We will go to text uh, six. Text six is a very interesting text. now let me open the slide for text 6 now this is uh, in a particular meter i think it is vasant tilika <clears throat> some of the first four verses and are in uh, anustup chanda chanda means the meter this is in vasant tilika drishte swabhav janitair vapush dosher न प्राकृतत्वमिह भक्त जनस्य पाशे गंगां बसाम न खलु बुद्बुद फेन पंके ब्रह्मद्रवत्वम अपगच्छति नीरधर्मे नाउ प्रोपर्स ट्रांसलेशन मोर ऑर लेस इज लाइक एन एंटायर एक्सप्लेनेशन ऑफ दिस वर्स सो यू विल नॉट बी एबल टू मैप इन द एग्जैक्ट वर्स एंड द ट्रांसलेशन बट आई हैव डन according to my best knowledge being situated in his original krishna conscious position <clears throat> a pure devotee does not identify with the body such a devotee should not be seen from a materialistic point of view drishte swabhava janita drishte means drishti drishti means to see 
so one should not see a pure devotee who is you know who does not identify with self with his body one should not see with a materialistic vision indeed one should overlook a devotee is having a body born in a low family a body with a bad complexion a deformed body or a diseased body or a infirm body now so many <laughs> details prabhupada has given in the translation so what is that materialistic vision we should not see vapushya dosha vapu means body dosha means faults so what are the faults prabhupada said is born in a family he is from a mlecha he is a mlecha uh, vaishnava no we should not say that a body with body with black bad complexion oh he is a african vaishnava he is a black vaishnava he is a white vaishnava like that a deformed body deformed means he is deformed he is he is limping or he is having a disease so all these materialistic visions vapushya joshe we should not see now there is also swabhava swabhava refers to nature that has to do with the subtle body every devotee has a particular nature and that nature is conditioned sometimes sometimes we might find fault with his body the doshas which are explained here sometimes we might find find in his nature by subtle vision we might uh, oh this devotee's nature is like this and we might find faults with it so that is swabhava janita vapu so there is gross materialistic vision where we see gross faults then there is a subtle mental vision by which we see faults in his nature so both these things are included in this verse and prabhupada is going to clarify that in his explanation according to ordinary vision such imperfections may be prominent in the body of a pure devotee but despite such seeming defects the body of a pure devotee cannot be polluted na prakritatvam ih na prakrita prakrita means material prakrit na prakritatvam means it is not material it is not in the state of prakrita prakrita is material ih ih means in this <clears throat> bhakta janasya bhakta janasya prapa translate as the pure devotee pashet pashet means to see so uh especially this refers to seeing a pure devotee from material vision and then in the next two lines that is the third line and the fourth line uh he gives rugva swami gives a beautiful analogy uh how we should not see Uh, from material vision a pure devotee a pure devotee is completely transcendental he is pure <clears throat> but how from an example he explains it is exactly like the water of ganges gangam basam which sometimes during the rainy season are full of bubbles budbude foam foam is fena and mud mud is called as panka pankaja pankaje pankair panka means mud in sanskrit and the lotus is called as pankaja pankaja means one which has born from mud the lotus is born from the mud below in the lake so although the lotus is born from the mud but the lotus is out in the lake and it is shining very beautiful so similarly uh, there might be external defects from a materialistic vision in a pure devotee but internally he is situated on a transcendental platform that's why we should not see the faults so that is the analogy given the ganga ganges water does not become polluted those who are advanced in spiritual understanding will bathe in the ganges without considering the condition of the water brahma dravatvam brahma means it is a spiritual water apagachati nira dharme it doesn't get spoiled and that is the dharma of the that is a characteristic of the ganges water the ganges water can never become polluted because of the external pollutions the ganges water is spiritual water and it is always spiritual it cannot get affected by the external foam bubbles and all other things 
so that is how we should also externally the pure devotee might have some bodily defects or in his nature you might see that he has got some particular nature we should not see that faults based on materialistic vision so here in this text 6 <clears throat> we'll just go again to the overview text 1 how a madhyam adhikari symptoms are mentioned of self control then the madhyam adhikari is external dealings and bhakti rules do's and don'ts bhakti pratikul shadgun bhakti anukul shadgun and shad with preeti lakshanam now text 5 which we had discussion how the madhyam adhikari does trivid vaishnav sevan now in the last paragraph last two paragraphs propat especially emphasized a madhyam adhikari to take association of a uttam adhikari and now a madhyam adhikari has been warned not to commit offense based on materialistic vision unto such a uttam adhikari so this text 6 is giving a warning not to commit vaishnav aparad to a uttam adhikari a prakrit vaishnave a prakrit vaishnave means a vaishnava is transcendental he is transcendentally situated especially a uttam adhikari who is in the stage of bhava and prema in the stage of bhava he has realized his identity he is situated in that identity in fact so he is a prakrit in fact sanatan go swami goes on to explain that uh, at the stage of bhava once body completely gets spiritualized it becomes fully spiritualized just like the iron it is fully kept in fire the iron fully is red hot similarly the body gets fully spiritualized and that is why he is called as a prakrit vaishnava a prakrit vaishnava prakrit drishti nished nished means it is prohibited to see a pure devotee from a materialistic vision so here again there is a development of the internal vision spoken you know how we should see from spiritual vision and not from a material vision a pure devotee now in the purport there are only two themes first prabhupad speaks about glory of shuddha bhakti then the six warnings against vaishnav criticism is from paragraphs 3 to 9 so let us now go to the purport any questions you have regarding uh, up till now with text 6 okay there is one question here first we will take up our iwf devotees who are here yes prabhu ji okay so very interesting question it's a nice question so here in this verse it is mentioned that um, Uh, one who is transcendentally situated a pure devotee one should not see faults in his vapu dosha uh, whether it is only applicable to a uh, uh, uttam adhikari a madhyam adhikari seeing a uttam adhikari like this or whether it is applicable to all the devotees in fact it is applicable to all the devotees but here in specific to the flow of upadeshamrit specially with respect to madhyam adhikaris dealing with kanishta madhyama and uttama and how a madhyama can further advance to the uttam level by only associating with the uttama and while associating with the uttama he should be careful not to see a uttam adhikari from a material platform and if he does that that is a severe offense and there will be severe reaction for it if he does it for a kanishta that is also offense and he'll get a you know a small dose of a reaction so the offense gravity will increase based on the level of the vaishnava <clears throat> if somebody criticizes a materialistic person he will get pop a vaishnava if he criticizes a materialistic if he criticizes a devotee a neophyte 
then he'll also get aparad and that aparad will affect his chanting but if he criticizes a mahabhagavat then he might his bhakti lata might be completely uprooted and he might leave devotional service so based on the gravity of the different levels of vaishnavas the effect is there so it is applicable to all i hope it is clear now there is one more question by poonam mata ji yes mata ji hari krishna prabhu ji uh, prabhu ji in the previous text uh, you uh, you said that uh, <clears throat> the person should not uh, uh, yeah the uttama adhikari uh, uh, we should be very careful when we are uh, choosing the uttama adhikari as a spiritual master but in this text uh, again it is coming that uh, we should not as you said right now that we should not look uh, see the uttama adhikari in the material platform does it related to the swabhav also like swabhav based on the swabhav only we sometime do get the you know the person is uh, good for our to become our spiritual master or not now the last part of your question i did not understand does it because of swabhav what Sabhav. Sabhav means the nature, like uh, the person is uh, doing the duty according to, uh, like you know, uh, as uttama adhikari or not. So based on that, uh, uh, a madhyama adhikari has to choose a spiritual master. So is it not uh, like uh, we have to go according to the looking the sabhav or how can we? I'm still not clear. What exactly is your question, Mataji? Because <laughs> Okay. In the in the previous text, uh, you said that uh, <clears throat> this uh, uttama adhikari. We have to be very careful to choose the uttama adhikari as a spiritual master. Correct. But in this text, uh, in this now, you are saying that uh, as a uttama adhikari, we should not look the uttama adhikari in the material platform. So, in the material platform, uh, there is a uh, also called, comes the swabhava. Swabhava. So swabhava means the nature. Yes, that's because of our nature. Correct. Uh, if if we so have to choose the, the uttama adhikari as a, our spiritual master, so we have to do. We have to not to see the nature of that, uh, like the spiritual master. Okay, so okay. Now I got it. Got it. Yes. Now few two things are there. Now our swabhava here is our material conditioning. based on our material conditioning we have a material consciousness and as the philosophy says atmanyavay jagat how we see the world is based on our level of consciousness from the material consciousness we see if we wear a red you know glass uh, specs then we see the things as red so that is why based on our conditioning we will see th- things like that so that is why here the warning is given uh, not to see based on material vision this is first point to be noted the second aspect which i am as i understand is that we have a particular nature and we would like to uh, 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 choose a spiritual master according to our nature yes that is also there the spiritual inclination is also there within the soul and some you know based on our mood of service some might like a particular spiritual master his nature his qualities and those qualities are attractive to me and i am attracted by the way he uh, practices devotional service his example is uh, a role model for me and i am naturally inclined to surrender my life and practice under his guidance so based on that spiritual inclination then one can select that spiritual master and there is no problem with that i hope it is clear yes prabhu yeah. ji yeah any other questions up till now okay so then now we will okay uh, yes mata ji hari krishna prabhu yes. uh, prabhu my question is that is uh, like last verse we read that one who is a uttam adhikari he doesn't find faults with others and he is situated in a high platform and all that Correct. now uh, I, i was reading bhagavatam and in that we see that uh, the kumaras they 
um, cursed the doorkeepers mm -hmm. and well, there was no i mean even though they felt sorry and all that uh, story again followed but uh, they are uttam adhikaris mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and the second one is in the same uh, bhagavatam only uh, brahma he had to leave the material body so that he could get another body to get married right that incident is also there where is that incident mentioned this is my first time reading bhagavatam prabhu so i think it's in the second canto where he looks at his daughter in a wrong way and uh, he feels remorse and he leaves his body and gets another body okay okay that is in third canto actually okay so regarding these two questions any other examples you have <laughs> no bro no. i've reached to learn okay. with that <laughs> okay <laughs> so regarding the two examples now first let us clarify now the four kumaras are actually the avatars of the lord they are the gyan shakti avatar of the lord and it is a past time that they are in the gyan mark they are atmarams now they heard from brahma about the supreme lord and they had a desire they had an attraction that let us go and have darshan of the lord of vaikuntha and because they are liberated souls they were going towards the vaikuntha <clears throat> now they came to vaikuntha and they passed the first door second door third door fourth door fifth door sixth door seventh door jain vijay stopped them now <clears throat> if you remember when we had discussed avirodha preeti and virodha yukta krodha <laughs> they had unlimited deep attachment for the lord of narayan and the door keepers you know stopped them and there was virod yukta krodh now it is mentioned by the acharyas that jain vijay <clears throat> knew the desire of the lord that our lord wants to enjoy viriras and we are related to them in pure spiritual rasa so we cannot act as the enemies of the lord and make him relish the viriras so they had pleaded earnestly to the lord oh let us be born as your enemies so that we can fulfill your desire and the lord had accepted that desire it is the lord who inspired jain vijay to stop the four kumaras and again it is the lord who inspired <coughs> uh the four kumaras to curse jain vijay because without that jain vijay would not come down and participate in the lord leaders and give him the relish of rasa of viriras so this is the past time uh, uh, which it was orchestrated by the lord himself uh, in order to fulfill his own mission to relish the virirasa so actually there was no such offense so that is how the acharyas explain it this is the first thing so <clears throat> this uh, Uh, vishnu chakra thakur gives in his explanation now regarding the second incident uh, of uh, brahma ji now it is very important we understand these pious times uh, from what the acharyas speak about it now maitre is relating this to vidur <clears throat> with respect to the creation past time and he says in fact uh, bhakti no thakur mentions that one should not speak about others one should not speak about others and especially others faults if one has to speak faults he has to speak fault about himself not about others because that is a great vaishnav aparadh criticism and it is a great prajalpa prajalpa in fact we know shadbir bhaktir vinashati destroys our devotion so one should not speak about others faults but maitre is narrating the fault of brahma ji with a higher purpose because to teach lessons to conditioned souls and this incident of brahma ji following vak his daughter had happened in some other kalpa way way back billions and trillions of years or way way back before any other before some creation kalpa but yet 
Brahmaji, uh, sorry, Maitreya Rishi is narrating this incident to Vidura to teach us conditioned souls. If Brahmaji, the first being, <clears throat> living being, the most purest of the living beings who's got that post of Brahma, he came under the control of lust. What about the conditioned souls in this material world? So in order to teach that lesson, Maitre Muni is narrating this incident. And there it is mentioned that Brahmaji uh, quit his body. So what does it mean to quit the body? Means to quit the mentality. He gave up that mentality is as good as quitting that body. And it is mentioned in the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, second canto, ninth chapter, Chatur Shloki Bhagavatam is there, where Brahmaji is instructed by Narayan himself. And in that it is mentioned that, you know, you will carry out the creation by my mercy and you will not fall in Maya. So in the beginning of the creation, Brahmaji had darshan of Mahavaikunta and directly the instructions in the form of Chatur Shloki Bhagavatam uh, from Narayan. And from that time onwards, he has never on the trap of Maya. But before that, this incident had happened. That is what Vishnu Chakra Thakur explains. And Maitre Muni is narrating this fault, narrating this fault of Brahmaji, not to find fault with Brahma, but to teach conditioned souls the power of lust. How powerful it is. Everyone who has come in this material world, <clears throat> in fact, lust has got love has got transformed into lust by coming in this creation. So how much we should be careful about lust? Just to make that point, he has narrated these pastimes. I hope it is clear, Mataji. So here also, in, if you want to understand, we should uh, uh, think that attitude is uh, more important than aptitude. Yes, yes. Our attitude, our mentality, uh, that mentality, we have to give it up. So that is what the lesson is. Okay, Prabhu. Thank you very much, Prabhu. Okay, so now let us go to uh, the purport. Uh, glories of pure devotion. Prabhupada first speaks about the glories of devotion, pure devotion because he is going to speak about the Uttamadikari who is situated on that platform. So that's why he first defines what is pure devotion. Should the bhakti is the activity of the soul proper, that is what? Engagement in the loving service of the Lord is performed in the liberated condition. So, should the bhakti is performed in the liberated condition? We are practicing sadhana bhakti now, <clears throat> and still our sabhava is not purified. We have anarthas. So, when the anarth nivritti happens, then the bhakti becomes pure, more and more pure. And at the stage of bhava, when one is liberated, the bhakti becomes fully pure. So that is how we should understand. Even in the sadhana stage now, we are practicing shuddha bhakti, but there is anart nivritti. Anarthas have not been destroyed till now. But slowly, slowly, as we practice shuddha bhakti, anarthas get destroyed, our bhakti becomes more and more pure. Just like gold, Gold which is extracted from the earth, <clears throat> you just uh, clean it off. It's gold. It's raw gold, but it is gold. It is pure. But further, uh, the gold is put in fire. And the fine impurities inside, uh, they also are eliminated. <laughs> and then the gold still shines further. So the gold, even when it was out from the mud, it was pure. The gold which was being processed in the fire, where the impurities, it was still pure. But still it has become purer <clears throat> in the form of, you know, when all the impurities are taken away and still it shines. So there is practice of Shuddha Bhakti in the sadhana stage. There is practice of Shuddha Bhakti in the bhava stage. And there is a practice of Shuddha Bhakti in the prema stage. And how we can understand? You know, Vishwanath Chakra Thakur gives the example of mango. There is the unripe mango 
and the ripe mango. Both are called mangoes. <laughs> so the unripe mango and ripe mango, there is no difference. One is, you know, unripe and other is ripe. And the unripe mango is sour, whereas the ripe mango is sweet. So sadhana bhakti is like that unripe mango. When we are chanting, you know, we don't get taste in chanting Harinam because anarth nivritti has not happened. So it is tapasya. But that same mango, when it becomes ripe, you would like to drink the mango juice, eat the mango pulp because it is nectarian. <clears throat> when you eat the unripe mango, the sour item, when it touches, the, you get a different emotion in the heart, right? <laughs> so you just don't like it too much. And you cannot eat uh, five, six unripe mangoes. You cannot eat it. It's not possible. Try eating six, seven unripe mangoes. There is so much disturbance in the body. And so much emotionally we become disturbed. But tell somebody to eat six, eight, uh, ten uh, ripe mangoes, pure Alfonso mangoes, he will eat it because it is nectarian. Similarly, chanting uh, in the sadhana stage, because of anarth nivritti, we don't get the taste. But in uh, the higher stages, in sadhya bhakti chanting, because the anarth nivritti has happened, uh, we get that taste. So that is the difference. Both stages, you know, we are practicing Shuddha Bhakti according to Rupa Goswami's definition. Shuddha Bhakti is practiced in the liberated stage. Prabhupada quotes Bhagavad Gita 14.26, where it is mentioned that Mamcha yo vebicharena bhakti yogena sevate sa gunan samitetan brahma bhuyaya kalpate. Just to emphasize that in the liberated condition, the bhakti which is practiced is pure, transcendental. And by bhakti yoga, one attains this level. One who engages, I will take the verse, one who engages in full devotional service, maam cha yaha avabhicharena, bhakti yogena sevate, by devotional service, sa gunan, he transcends the mood, samititan transcends, <clears throat> Gunatit, we had mentioned. Na? Etan, all these modes, he attains Brahma Bhuvaya So, at the stage of Bhava, also one is in the liberated stage. So, Brahma Bhuvaya Kalpati. Now, I'll just take one point here and then we'll take up the question. It is very interesting. Before I explain, I would like to ask a question. Here it is mentioned as a Vabhichar in Bhakti. So what is the difference between a Vabhicharena Bhakti and a Hetuki Bhakti? Anyone knows? Anyone would like to say about it? A Vabhicharena Bhakti and a Hetuki Bhakti. There is one hand which is raised here. Anyone else? Okay. Yes, Prabhuji. Okay. Avvabhicharan is uninterrupted and Ahetuki is pure. Okay. Uh, Shrivali uh, Ratna Mataji. Shrivali Ratna Mataji. What is your answer? Uh, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Ahetuki means without expecting anything in return. You are doing the service because you want to. Yes. And that's what is your uh, constitutional service. It yes. comes naturally. And avyabhicharena means it does not, uh, you do not stop it uninterrupted, kind of. Yes. So uh, in uh, Ahituka Bhakti, there is no expectation. But why in this verse it is mentioned as avyabhicharena? What is the expectation here in this verse which is being mentioned? This verse. I know it is that difficult. you'll reach that you'll reach the level of Brahman. Yes, exactly. 
so this is this verse is coming from the 14th chapter of the gita verse uh, chapters 13 to 18 almost end of 13 to 8 end of 18 chapter speak about gyan yoga and what krishna is doing in the bhagavad gita is he is explaining how gyan yoga is uh, bhakti yoga is superior to gyan yoga so in the 13th chapter also if you remember there are 20 items of knowledge krishna explains there are 20 items of knowledge and <clears throat> one of the items is also ma mai chanen yogena bhaktir avavicharena so two times this word avavicharena bhakti has come and proper you see the word to word translation for avavicharena he says it is without any break so the gyanis practice 20 items of knowledge beginning from you know amanitvam adamvitam ahimsa shanti arjavam acharya upasanam vairagya then going into the forest you know that means gyanis can you know have to be sanyasis they have to renounce family life in order to practice gyan yoga and one of the items is also that they out of the 20 items there is one item that they practice bhakti also and in fact because of that bhakti only they get the fruit of their gyan yoga practice that is ultimately liberation which is bhakti which is present in that gyan yoga by which they attain the liberation so the gyanis desire liberation so without break they practice these 20 items along with one item of bhakti that is why prabhupad while explaining this verse he explains that of all the descriptions of the process of knowledge the most important point is described in the first line of the 11th verse that is a vevichanini prabhupad says is unalloyed devotional service so if one practices pure devotional service as per rupa goswami then he not not practice the other 19 items so those who are practicing bhakti yoga now they need not cultivate these 20 items of knowledge they have to only cultivate bhakti yoga and just by practicing bhakti yoga all the good qualities will come amanitvam adham vitvam ahimsa shanti marjavan acharya upasanam everything will come up in fact devotees uh, only in bhakti yoga can be practiced even any ashram this cannot be practiced as i was mentioning asakti ranab विश्वंग पुत्र धार ग्रहादेशु एंड विविध देश से विक्तन वन शुड गो इन द फॉरेस्ट द हिमालयस एंड प्रैक्टिस दिस सो यू यू कैन नॉट प्रैक्टिस दिस ओनली इन भक्ति योगा यू कैन स्टे इन द टेंपल और स्टे एट होम एंड प्रैक्टिस अटेन योर डिवोशन एंड गो बैक टू स्पिरिचुअल वर्ल्ड बट द ज्ञानीज हैव टू प्रैक्टिस दिस 20 आइटम्स अलोंग विद वन आइटम भक्ति योगा दैट इज अ व्यभिचार इन दे प्रैक्टिस दैट अनइंटरप्रेटेडली एंड by which they can attain liberation now the words which was mentioned by propad it is mentioned here that when they practice this avvicharini bhakti what happens they transcend sa gunan samita and attain brahma brahma bhuya ekalpati and propad is very clear here elevated to the brahman platform now if this was a hetu ki bhakti this verse was speaking about a hetu ki bhakti we would not attain brahman platform we'll attain the spiritual world so why it is mentioning brahman platform because this bhakti practiced by the gyan yogis without fail without interruption it is a vibhicharini bhakti there is a hetu they have a hetu the gyanis have a hetu to attain liberation they transcend the modes definitely and they transcend the modes by practicing the 20 items of knowledge along with that one element of bhakti practice and it is that bhakti element which is there in their gyan yoga practice actually gives the fruit of liberation to them brahma bhuya ekalpa whereas pure devotional service which is called as ahetuki or nishkinchana bhakti what to speak of attaining the spiritual world salokya samipya srashti diyamanam न ग्रणंती विना मत सेवनम जना माय प्योर डिओटीज कपिल सेज व्हाट टू स्पीक अबाउट अटेनिंग सायुज लिबरेशन 
they don't even accept the other forms of liberation which are in the vaikuntha planets they just want pure service that's it so that is pure devotion that is called as ahetu ki bhakti hetu hetu means there is some uh, cause that i will practice bhakti and attain this that is not pure devotion so the gyanis have this mishra bhakti and that is why uh, they attain brahma bhuyaya kalpate so propad uh, although he doesn't do this uh, fine analysis for a particular reason uh, but he, i wanted to clarify that there is difference between avyabicharini bhakti and ahetu ki bhakti propad uh, more or less uses the terms uh, synonymously but there is you uh, know when we study deeply the bhagavad gita and study deeply the acharya's commentaries uh, we can understand you know these differences as we study the bhagavad gita very scrutinizingly then we come to know right, karma yoga gyan yoga bhakti yoga these three divisions you know to understand they are not easy <laughs> but uh, as we study the bhagavad gita bhakti shastri also these things will be clarified to you definitely so propad is now using this term and synonymously but you should know now by now that there is difference between this propad is here saying avyabicharini bhakti means unalloyed devotion but definitely uh, there is some hetu here and propad now goes on to define pure devotion here this is high hetu ki bhakti a person engaged in devotional service must be free from material motives whereas a gyani has a motive to attain liberation there is motive there in this krishna conscious movement one's consciousness must be changed if the consciousness is aimed towards material enjoyment it is material consciousness if it is aimed towards serving krishna it is krishna consciousness very simple definition of whether we are krishna conscious or materially conscious so proper the saying here <clears throat> consciousness if it is material it is aimed for material enjoyment if it is aimed for serving krishna then it is krishna consciousness shuddh bhakti propad is mentioned as free from material motives actually it is ahetu ki bhakti that we should be clear about now propad explains ahetu ki bhakti that is the definition given by rupa goswami in the bhakti rasamrita sindhu a surrendered soul serve krishna serves krishna without material considerations anya abilashita shunyam gyan karmadya anavratam unalloy devotional service which is transcendental to the activities of the body and mind such as gyan and karma is called pure bhakti yoga so we will when we study bhakti rasamrita sindhu we will spend almost one entire class to understand this definition of pure devotional service but now just we'll just understand these terms anya abilashita shunyam means no other desire except the desire to please the lord to do activities for pleasing the lord that is anya abilashita shunyam gyan karma di anavrata means karma means doing activities so that one can attain enjoyment in this world or enjoyment in swarga that is karma kanda and gyan means cultivation of knowledge with a purpose to attain liberation that is the upanishads and vedanta so it should be free from this gyan karma di anavrata and anukulena krishnanu anukulena manushu with a favorable favorable attitude serve krishna his spiritual masters or the avatars all are included in this or even uh, krishna anything connected to krishna like the cows tulsi bhakti devi all that comes in this favorable attitude shilanam means activities uh, activities and this kind of bhakti is called as uttama bhakti so that's how it is being defined now after defining <clears throat> bhakti yoga bhakti yoga is the proper activity of the soul and when one actually is engaged in unalloyed uncontaminated devotional service he is already liberated he is already liberated sa gunan samiteitan propad's referring 
Krishna's devotees are not subject to material conditions, even though his bodily features may apparent may appear materially conditioned. One should therefore not see a pure devotee from the materialistic point of view. So that is why, after defining Shuddha Bhakti, <coughs> uh, Prabhupada explains that he is not subject to the material conditions. That's why we should not see such a pure devotee from a materialistic point of view. That is that is what he is mentioning here. So we should have this clear understanding. Now there is one question. I will take up that question and then uh, then we will then we will continue. Uh, yes, Mataji, you have a question. I have one minute to do. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Prana. Prabhu, you just said like jnana, the jnana yoga, jnana yoga means we try to know about the, the Lord through the knowledge. Right? That, that's a jnana yoga. Jnana yoga is like, he doesn't do any bhakti as such, but he, he try to attain liberation through the knowledge about the Lord. According to my understanding, generally they do meditation and other things. But here it is said like uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, it is said like they are able to attain the level of Brahman because there is they are doing some bhakti. Can you just clarify that? No, firstly, uh, the Gyan, what exactly is Gyan you have to understand? Now, the Gyan Yogis... Uh, study especially the Upanishads which describe the Brahman. The Upanishads speak about the Brahman. So the Gyan, the Upanishads and the Vedantas, they are engaged in that study, philosophical uh, speculation it is called. They philosophically try to understand what is Brahman and what is not Brahman. Neti Neti is their process. It is not that. It is not that. And this is how they try to study the Upanishads and try to understand. So they don't engage their senses in actions because they know that if we engage the senses in actions, there is action, there is reaction. So they withdraw themselves from all sensory engagement and they try to become fixed uh, by uh, purifying the senses through philosophical speculation by studying the Upanishads and the Vedanta. Of course, in the Jnana path also, uh, they are all renounced sannyasis living in the forest, in the Himalayas. And there is also meditation. Meditation uh, is also lim is there. That It's not that 24 hours they are just speculating about you know, what the Upanishads actually meaning is. But there is also meditation as one limb. But all this knowledge, uh, what they try to acquire... Uh, there is a hetu so that ultimately they can attain liberation. So this kind of gyan uh, is what uh, is being so spoken as jnana karamadi anavritam. Anavritam means it should not cover. Now in bhakti also we attain knowledge, gyan about bhagwans, bhagwans rupa, bhagwans qualities, pastimes, and the sambandha gyan. What is our relationship with the Lord? What is our constitution? All this knowledge, uh, it uh, this kind of gyan is without hetu because this knowledge leads to devotion. This knowledge leads to devotion. And the more we uh, do devotion, that devotion also will lead to knowledge because dadami buddhi yogam tam the more we perform that devotion, Krishna will give us the knowledge how to perform that devotion properly. So, the devotional jnana in Bhakti Yoga with Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Svaranam, that jnana doesn't have a hetu. There is no purpose in that to attain liberty. Social service. But if we separately cultivate jnana, in order to get liberation, there is a hetu, and that will cover our pure devotion. So that is what is being 
spoken in that verse. I hope it is clear, Mataji. Hare Krishna Guru. No, Prabhu, it's uh, like the uh, bhakti means Prabhupada says devotional service. So when the jnanis are not doing any service, they are just reading, speculating, reading the Upanishads. Then how, uh, how they you said like they were able to attain the liberation because bhakti is there. So what kind of bhakti they are doing because they are not serving okay. the Lord in any okay. Okay, I understood now. See, we have, we see through our lens because now we are in bhakti and we are doing devotional service. Uh, in fact, in all the paths, be it karma kand or jnana kand and the upasana kand where there is bhakti yoga, there is a slight element of bhakti in that. The karma kandis who want to go to swarga, they are doing yagyas in order to attain swarga. But they are also chanting Om Mantra. Every, you know, Yajna, they have to chant Om Mantras, although it must be specifically for a Devata also. But still, that Mantra Jai chant, they are taking the name of the Lord. So there is some Bhakti in it. There is some devotion. But it is not, you know, predominantly devotion. The, The main thing is Karma. Do this Yajna, karmic actions by which we can attain the fruit of going to Swarga. So karma is predominant. That's why it is called as karma yoga. Whereas in the jnana, the jnana path is predominant. That is the practice of jnana yoga. But along with that, they do some bhajan, taking the names of the Lord. So there is a little bit bhakti also. That's why in the 20 elements, there is one element bhakti they practice. So this kind of bhakti is called as mishra bhakti. It is Bhakti, which is mixed with all other practices. So there is that bhakti, actually the term which is used is Jnana Mishra Bhakti. <clears throat> Depends again now, those who are practicing devotion and there is also the four Kumaras are called as Jnana Mishra Bhaktas. They came in touch with the devotion, the Jnana <clears throat> completely got purified and they became pure devotees. Whereas the Jnana Yogis who are exclusively practicing Jnana Yoga, they might also be practicing one limb of Bhakti. They might be doing some bhajans, taking the names of Lord, Lord's names. So that kind of Bhakti, what they practice, there is little element of Bhakti in it. And that is why it is called as Mishra Bhakti. It is not just devotion to Bhagwan. They are devoted to Brahman. They want to attain liberation. But they also do some bhajans, take the names of the lords. And that bhakti element which is there in that gyan practice, that bestows the fruit of liberation to them, not their gyan process. It is only bhakti. The karma kandis who want to attain swarga, <clears throat> it is not that karma that, that, that sacrifices give the result. It is that little bit bhakti which is present in that karmakanda process, that bhakti which bestows the fruit of swarga to them. So this is a very elaborate subject and only when we study the Bhagavad Gita, uh, many things will become clear about it. I but hope, I hope it is clear now uh, what it means. Unam Mataji has one question. Yes, Mataji, I have unmuted you. Uh, Prabhuji, uh, sorry to ask you uh, after a long time. I want to know the meaning of sadhya and sadhana. What is the meaning of sadhya and sadhana? We discussed in the first class. Sadhana means uh, like continuously we are uh, doing the process. And the sadhya is our goal. Is it yes, like yes. The means and the ends. Okay. Sadhana is the means and sadhya is the end. So in uh, Bhakti Yoga, in Bhakti Yoga, our sadhana is we practice bhakti, and at the end, you know, we attain pure bhakti and still we continue to practice bhakti. Now also you are practicing here bhakti, 
and when we become pure also we'll practice that bhakti that bhakti will be more pure in the spiritual world also where we go to in the spiritual world also there we continue to practice bhakti in still more perfected stage so bhakti continues so then there is no difference between sadhya and sadhana there is no difference between sadhya and sadhana in karma kanda the sadhana is to perform the yagya the goal is to attain swarga so in swarga they don't perform any yagyas they don't do any sadhana they have attained swarga they enjoy their pious credits what they have done in the form of yagyas and they enjoy there so the sadhana and sadhya is different there the means and the ends the gyanis practice sadhana of gyan yoga practicing this 20 limbs and ultimately they want to attain what liberation sadhya that is liberation so when they are liberated then they do more practice the gyan yoga path the ashtang yogis practice the ashta anga yama niyama asana and that is sadhana for them and ultimately they want to merge in the impersonal brahman that is their sadhya so that's how we should understand the difference between sadhana and sadhya uh, prabhu ji as we talk about the brahman also merging right now as you are discussing about ashtang yoga uh, does this hatha yoga people also who are following the hatha yoga also comes in this yes in the ashtang yoga there are again some uh, divisions there is the hatha yoga and then there is the raj yoga and there are subtle differences between the two in the raj yoga there is purification by different processes and in the hatha yoga there is purification by different mudras ultimately the gross purifications of the body are mentioned there and then once they are elevated then they are you know there is the purification in the terms of you know doing pratyahar dharan dhan samadhi like that so then there is the shat chakra yoga also shat chakra means you know to focus on the different chakras so like that there are subtle differences and uh, we should just know it that's it we need not go into the details about it okay, by practicing bhakti yoga all our chakras will get purified you know uh, by practicing bhakti yoga our body will get purified we need not practice the raj yoga to purify our body of course we should keep our body healthy and take healthy prasadam and you know we need not practice any mudras for purification we just chant the hari krishna sitting in dhyan mudra that's sufficient for us okay thank you thank you okay okay any other questions anyone has okay so yes should the bhakti definition we have sent studied and how krishna's devotees were on the shuddha bhakti platform uh, they should not be you know seen from material vision now this is a very important statement unless one is actually a devotee he cannot see another devotee perfectly so um, mahabhagavat we cannot recognize him only another mahabhagavat can recognize another mahabhagavat so that is why uh just like a, a goldsmith you know he gets a stone he can recognize what the stone is because his eyes are trained in that and for ordinary person take ordinary any other stone he doesn't know the value it's like it might be a gem so similarly a mahabhagavat only can recognize another mahabhagavat and during uh, bhakti siddhant sarosh thakur time there was vamsi das baba ji maharaj you must have heard this name he was a paramahamsa situated transcendental transcendental platform he was completely oblivious to the world he was like a avduta he used to never take bath he was practically you know naked and he had his gornita duties where he used to directly speak with gornita sometimes he used to punish gornita <laughs> with a stick and gornita used to run away from him so such <laughs> a mahabhagavat he was and people thought he was a mad person it is only bhakti siddhant sure thakur who recognize vamsi das baba ji maharaj as a mahabhagavat so only one devotee it is actually unless one is actually devotee he can, cannot see another devotee perfectly so this is especially is referring to a uttam adhikari a madhyam adhikari can discriminate in fact 
as explained in the previous verse there are three types of devotees kanishta madhyama and uttama a kanishta devotee cannot distinguish between a devotee and a non devotee that's why he doesn't associate with the devotees makes friendship with them he is simply concerned with worshiping the deity in the temple a madhyam adhikari however can distinguish between a devotee and non devotee as well as between a devotee and the lord thus he treats the supreme personality of godhead the devotee and the non devotee in a different different ways we saw that ishwar utta dadineshu balishu dishatsapi prema maitri kripa opsha kripa upeksha yah karoti samadhyam we saw that right this is how a madhyam adhikari can discriminate so after explaining this now propat comes to the point of this verse so two paragraphs he sets the background now how a madhyam adhikari should not see uh, especially a pure devotee <clears throat> with materialistic vision so there are six warnings here six warnings against vaishnav criticism that is from paragraphs 3 to 9 which we will see uh tomorrow tomorrow we will complete this text tomorrow we will see this this is a very important verse for us to understand how we should uh, become free from the tendency to find faults either because of gross vision or us because of subtle mental vision uh, this fault finding tendency is there and fault finding leads uh, leads to ninda or criticism which becomes a obstacle in our path of bhakti so how to avoid that uh, propas is explained in paragraphs 3 to 9 we will see that tomorrow any other clarifications anyone has regarding what we discussed till now today okay then so we will stop here शील प्रोपाद की जय शी उपदेश अमृत की जय शी रूप गोस्वामी पाद की जय हरे कृष्ण